Glory be to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one true God. Amen. Slomo and welcome to Orho the Way. We wish you all a blessed and happy New Year 2024. The year 2023 is celebrated as the year of the 15th centennial jubilee of Morphilexinos of Mabuk. There were many conferences, publications, and events to celebrate the life and works of Morphilexinos. Here at Urho the Way, we are extending the celebrations and organizing a series of lectures on Morphilexinos of Mabuk. Today, we are so excited to introduce to you an authority on the early Christian Church, Dr. David Michelson. Dr. M Michelson is a professor at the Vanderbilt University. He earned his PhD in history from Princeton and his teaching and research focuses on the history of Christianity in the Middle East, Asia, and Africa. In particular, he is interested in the historical texts in the Syriac language. His first book, The Practical Christology of Morphilexinus of Mabuk, published by Oxford University Press 2014, analyzes in detail the works of Morphilexinus of Mabuk. Today, Dr. Michelson will discuss on the topic, the contribution of Morphilexinus to Eastern Christianity beyond the Syrian Orthodox Church. In this, in this lecture, he examines the later influence of Morphilexinos' work, writings, and reputation have had on the Eastern Christianity beyond the Syriac Orthodox Church. And this lecture is divided into three topics. Number one is an overview of different historical perspectives of Morphilexinos. How has been the Syriac Orthodox faithful received Morphilexinos of Mabug and his teaching, and how the other Syrian communities have viewed him, and what might we learn from the overlap. Secondly, Dr. Michelson will examine the ecumenical Philexinos, the ecumenical legacy of Philexinos, especially the influence because of the fact that his texts were translated and circulated in other languages like Armenian or Abai and Greek, and also the attributed works, the, the Philixinos of attribution, where, he, where the works of other authors were attributed to more Philixinos as they circulated across confessional lines in the Middle, Middle Ages. Number three, he will examine how more Philixinos work were recognized by later generations and shared across the East and West Syriac Church, despite the Christological differences among these churches. With that brief introduction, let me welcome Malfono, Dr. David Michelson, to give his talk on the contributions of Morphilexinos of Mabuk to Eastern Christianity beyond the Syrian Orthodox Church. Welcome, Malfono, to Urho the Way and this lecture series. The floor is yours. Thank you, Father Renjan. It's really a pleasure to uh, be here together with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. Welcome, Malfono. Uh, well, I'll uh, jump right into uh, the topic, and, and I do just want to thank you again, um, Father Renjan, and also uh, Deacon Jobin, who uh, you know, it took uh, a good deal of uh, arranging calendars to make this possible. Uh, and we're just after the 1500th anniversary, but I think uh, more Philoxenos has plenty worth celebrating. So this is an excellent opportunity to extend it. Um, and uh, in some ways, of course, just the fact that uh, Syriac Christians uh, from the St. Thomas traditions of India are interested in more Philoxenos uh, already proves my point that uh, he has a wide and uh, ecumenical appeal well beyond uh, the regions of Roman Syria, where he was a bishop uh, in his own time, uh, the 5th and early 6th century. Um, some of the remarks that I'll make here, I also uh, was originally invited to 
um, put together by uh, His Grace Mor Dionysios and His Grace Mor Severios uh, of the Syrian Orthodox Church uh, in honor of Mor Philoxenos. So again, uh, getting to talk with different uh, parts of the Syriac tradition about this influential Syriac uh, theologian and uh, ascetic teacher really uh, is an honor. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the excellent introduction. Uh, and uh, I'll just repeat again sort of the three main topics that I hope to cover. So uh, I hope to reveal in more detail the legacy that Philoxenos has contributed to the development of ascetic contemplative theology. So the theology of contemplation and monasticism, uh, a theology, of course, very important in the West Syrian tradition, but also which had an influence that extended uh, to other non-Chalcedonian churches, the Armenians, the Ethiopian Orthodox, but also to Chalcedonians, including the Melkites uh, and the Greek and Slavonic traditions as found in the uh, very important text in those traditions of Philokalia. So I'll cover three main topics. First, I'll survey, survey various Philoxenoses or Philoxeni or Oxnoye, whatever the plural of Philoxenos must be, uh, in other words, I, I want to look at him from three different sort of legacies and reputations. So uh, how has he been received by the Syrian Orthodox faithful? Uh, how has he been viewed by other Syriac communions? And uh, then finally, what might we today uh, in the 21st century uh, learn from this broader ecumenical interest and overlap of Philoxenos um, legacy? Uh, so... Uh, <clears throat> that ecumenical Philoxenos is our, is our ultimate goal because uh, his texts were translated and circulated in Armenian, Arabic, Greek, Ge'ez. Uh, and in addition, sometimes his name was lost as his writings crossed linguistic confessional boundaries, but nevertheless, his texts were still transmitted under the names of others. Um, and then in addition, sometimes works not by Philoxenos were attributed to him, or his name was put on the, the writings of others. So in this way, Philoxenos had a sort of multi-part um, reception, um, at which really is my, my third point, that his ecumenical appeal is much larger than I think we've realized even uh, among scholars who specialize in Philoxenos. Uh, there aren't that many of us. Um, but uh, in the same way that from the East Syrian tradition, Isaac of Nineveh, has a, a broad appeal and influence in the West Syrian tradition, in the Greek and, and Slavonic traditions. Uh, Philoxenos actually enjoys uh, a similar reputation, but at a sort of earlier stage of historical um, development. Now, I've probably confused myself, and I'm sure everyone listening to this, uh, by describing the different legacies of Philoxenos. Um, so let's just be, take them one by one here. So. The first is the many medieval memories of Philoxenos. Um, so there are many perspectives on Philoxenos, in part because his life and service to the church were marked by the shifting boundaries, both political and ecclesiastical, of those tumultuous uh, periods after the Council of Chalcedon. Um, Philoxenos was born in the Persian Empire. He was educated uh, by the Church of the East. Yet ultimately, he became a leading Miaphysite or one nature bishop west of the Euphrates in Roman territory, and he both earned and lost the favor of Roman emperors in Constantinople during his own lifetime. So given this prominence, it's not surprising we can find a lot of different perspectives on Philoxenos in the centuries after his death. Um, of course, it makes sense to begin with his own communion, the Syrian Orthodox Church, where Philoxenos was remembered and received uh, as perhaps a martyr in exile for the cause of the Miaphysite Christology and the opposition to the Council of Chalcedon. Uh, and several 6th and 7th century manuscripts cite his works alongside Cyril of Jerusalem and Severus of Antioch, putting him really on a high level uh, of influence. Um, now, the patriarch Severus of Antioch received greater liturgical commemoration, uh, being remembered in the liturgies, but Philoxenos' grew, cult grew strong, particularly in the Tur of Dean, that uh, heartland of uh, West Syrian monasticism, and his relics were transferred to a church dedicated to him in Midyat, 
uh, and to the monastery of Mor Gabriel. Uh, we have a 13th century life of Philoxenos. Some interesting scholarship is coming out now showing that uh, uh, the author who we thought of that life is actually just a misreading of other scholars. Um, so I look forward to my colleagues uh, further commentary on that valuable uh, hagiography of Philoxenos. Um, but what we can draw from the, the medieval and even modern uh, commemoration of Philoxenos as a saint in the Syrian Orthodox Church are sort of the following things. He was remembered as a saint, as I said, who was a champion and a martyr for the cause of Miaphysite Christological Orthodoxy. Uh, he was also remembered as spreading Christianity in general in the region uh, of Western and Upper Mesopotamia, uh, where he was a bishop. He was also remembered as a prolific theological authority, um, both in citations in Florilegia and in the echoes of his New Testament translation and commentaries. Um, when I was writing my book, we thought that perhaps Philoxenos was one of uh, the most prolific Syriac authors. That seems now to be uh, Jacob of Seruj, but uh, certainly Philoxenos still was a very prolific author who wrote uh, a lot. Um, he also has liturgies attributed to him. This is an area really that needs further study. So I hope that uh, the listeners to this uh, lecture, one of you might be inspired to go and study the liturgical texts attributed to Philoxenos. Um, and then lastly, Philoxenos was remembered as a monk, uh, an ascetic theologian uh, who taught the life of renunciation uh, and the theology of the desert mothers and fathers uh, from Egypt as it was adapted into the West Syrian tradition. Um, <clears throat> it's not surprising given that Philoxenos was remembered, uh, especially in Turabdin, that uh, in the hagiographic accounts, they claim that Philoxenos himself may have been a monk in Tour of Dean. Um, we don't have sources for this from his own lifetime, however. Uh, so what I want to uh, get into in my uh, remarks that follow are that uh, the memory of Philoxenos as a saint is mainly uh, restricted to the Syrian Orthodox. So, for example, the sister communions of the Armenians or the Coptic Church did not produce hagiographies of Philoxenos, um, but this doesn't mean that he wasn't unknown, that he was unknown outside the Syrian Orthodox world. The Armenian Second Council of Dwin in 555 translated and cited Philoxenos as an authoritative source for their own rejection of the Council of Chalcedon, uh, and Philoxenos' reputation as a defender of uh, Miaphysite Christology meant that he was viewed as a spreader of heresy from the Chalcedonian and East Syrian perspectives. Um, now, with all due uh, respect for uh, those who are listening, I, I hope that you won't mind my uh, citing some of the more uh, critical views of Philoxenos, but I, I do it for a reason. Even though these are negative views of Philoxenos, they actually show us as if in a mirror how influential he was. Um, so the first comes from the Church of the East in the 7th century from Babai the Great in his book on the Union. And Babai notes Philoxenos' East Syrian origins. So he claims that the pastors of the Church of the East had chased Philoxenos from their lands like a shepherd chasing a wolf. Uh, and he describes Philoxenos this way. He began to creep insidiously through the monasteries towards uncultured and simple people, those not educated in the scriptures. This is from a translation by John Zaleski. Now, we don't have to accept Babai's personal attack on Philoxenos, but this passage actually is useful in what it tells us about Philoxenos' reputation. First, Babai acknowledges that Philoxenos had origins in and was familiar with the Church of the East. Second, while Babai is primarily objecting to Philoxenos on the grounds of his Christology, Babai's comment reveals that he's aware of Philoxenos' reputation as not only a monastic theologian, but even a very influ influential monastic theologian. So in short, even Philoxenos' enemies acknowledge that he was familiar with the theology and the monastic teaching or pedagogy of the Church of the East, and that his reputation was high in monastic circles and may have even appealed to monks in the Church of the East. Um, Babai's comments are all the more interesting when we pair them with a very similar description of Philoxenos coming from a Western source, 
uh, a manuscript from uh, Sinai. This is a Chalcedonian or Melkite manuscript, which contains an anonymous short biography of Phloxenos, um, perhaps from the 8th or 9th century. This anonymous Chalcedonian author mounts criticisms that are similar to Babai, uh, though with some further detail. First, the author describes Phloxenos as one of the former heads of the school of Edessa, who was well-versed in the teaching of the East Syrian school, but then forced out uh, because he refused to adhere to the Christology of Nestorius. So unlike Babai, the author then describes Phloxenos as having fled to the Chalcedonian side, where he then came into the conflict uh, with the leadership. Again, here, there's an interesting comment. So this Western opponent of Phloxenos says, quote, Phloxenos circulated among the cells of the monasteries, and he insulted Flavian, and with him the Council of Chalcedon and the Tome of Leo, and he caused many to wander from the simple. Now, of course, this here is, again, a hostile source, but interestingly, it shows that Philoxenos was known for his monastic influence, and it provides confirmation, albeit from a Chalcedonian point of view, of how Philoxenos was remembered. Indeed, the author asserts even more strongly than Babai that Philoxenos was well-versed in East Syrian theology, and it's interesting, there's a phrase that occurs in both of these uh, comments on Philoxenos, uh, they mentioned the word simple, so uh, pshito. So he caused many to wonder from the simple, pshite, plural in this case. Uh, now, of course, this could be used as an insult here. Uh, Babai seems to mean the unlearned by it. But this is a very important Syriac term in monastic vocabulary. Indeed, Philoxenos himself uses it as a technical term to refer to the humility and simplicity that is essential for the monastic way of life. Uh, indeed, there are other monastic technical terms in the Syriac of this criticism of Philoxenos that he circulated among the cells of the monastery and, quote, caused many to wander from the simple. So what's going on here is an awareness that Philoxenos is teaching a very common form of monastic theology, uh, uh, tutho, stillness, simplicity. Um, so this charge is, in fact, a, a sort of mirror or reverse image of uh, exactly the sort of thing that Philoxenos was teaching against the Christology of Chalcedon. Philoxenos, one of his main objections to the Christology of Chalcedon was that uh, it was overly speculative and complex and distracted the monk from the simple contemplative life uh, required for true monasticism. So, uh, peace to the critics of Philoxenos. Um, I'm not endorsing uh, their descriptions of him, uh, but they are evidence for that even among his enemies, Philoxenos was recognized uh, for his monastic influence and his reputation as a monastic teacher and perhaps even a teacher of simplicity. So <clears throat> this brings me to the second point of my talk. Uh, regardless of whether the medieval accounts of Phloxenos are hagiographic, they're praising him as a saint, or are hostile, they're condemning him as a, a heretic, the medieval traditions agree that Phloxenos had an ecumenical appeal, uh, especially to monastic audiences. So Babai is worried about East Syrian audience, m monastic audiences uh, reading Phloxenos' text. The Melkite, anonymous Melkite author is worried about uh, Melkite, Chalcedonian, West Syrian uh, monastic readers of Philoxenos. So uh, this is the ecumenical Philoxenos. Now, I use this term in a, in a general way. I'm not referring to the very important modern ecumenical dialogue, the interchurch dialogue between uh, different historic churches, um, though I do hope that rediscovering this ecumenical Philoxenos will be useful um, to ecumenical dialogue. What I mean by the ecumenical Philoxenos here is just the historical fact that Philoxenos' influence and interest in Philoxenos uh, can be found well beyond the boundaries of uh, the Syrian Orthodox Church in Mesopotamia. Um, so we can gauge this legacy of Philoxenos uh, in two aspects. So first, how did his own text circulate beyond uh, the boundaries of the Syrian Orthodox Church? And second, 
how can we trace how Philoxenos name even enabled other texts uh, to circulate more widely? So Philoxenos works circulating, and then sometimes even without his works, just his name circulating. Um, there's not yet been a systematic study of the works of Philoxenos in medieval translations. So again, uh, I hope that uh, someone younger than me listening to this uh, feels motivated perhaps to go uh, do a study of that. Um, but there's been a good deal of work uh, gathering the basic information, uh, especially by um, the distinguished Belgian scholar André de Halle. Um, and so I'll just summarize what we know. There are Armenian, Armenian translations uh, of some of the works of Philoxenos, including fragments of his commentary uh, on the prologue to the Gospel of St. John. There are Arabic translations of his ascetic discourses and other monastic texts that he wrote. Um, most significantly, there are Greek and Ge'ez translations of his monastic letter to Patricius. Uh, and in addition to translations, there are Melkite Syriac manuscripts which copied uh, and contained excerpts from his work, uh, again, from his monastic works. I'm not aware of any East Syrian manuscripts uh, containing works by Philoxenos, though I would be delighted uh, if somebody proved me wrong by uh, finding some. So, in short, Philoxenos' work found interest in the West, both from non-Chalcedonians and Chalcedonians. Um, notably, it was his monastic works, and especially his letter to Patricius. Uh, I regret that there's not an English translation. There is a French translation uh, in addition to the published Syriac text uh, in Petrologia Orientalis. Um, so, if we're considering Philoxenos' reputation, uh, we must also consider what we can learn about how practices of uh, pseudonymy or using false attribution or anonymous texts uh, affected his texts. So first, we should note that Philoxenos' letter to Patricius came to circulate in Syriac and in Greek under the name of and with other works by Isaac of Nineveh, an East Syrian theologian and monastic teacher. Um, one of these is Vatican manuscript, Syriac manuscript 125. Um, in addition, some West Syrian manuscripts uh, equate Philoxenos with the figure Nihilus or Pseudo-Nihilus. Uh, we don't actually see uh, text with this, but we have a note from a scribe. Um, so it's clear that scribes were aware that Philoxenos' works fit in with a larger tradition of the works of St. Evagrius and of Isaac of Nineveh. Um, and so could be included under names associated with those figures, even without Philoxenos, you know, remove Philoxenos' name, put attach the name of Isaac of Nineveh. Interestingly, two other major uh, monastic manuals circulated with Philoxenos' name attached, even though they were actually by East Syrian monastic authors. So the one is Joseph Hazaya's letter on the three degrees uh, of the ascetic life, um, and when this text, which is East Syrian in origin, came to circulate in Syrian Orthodox manuscripts and then through translation in Armenian and Arabic, it did so with Philoxenos' name on the text um, for reasons that we'll get to uh, in a minute. Uh, another influential East Syrian ascetic text also came to be uh, attached to Philoxenos' name in trans translation, the so-called Commentary on the Paradise of the Fathers um, by Dadisho of Qatar. Um, Philoxenos' name appears to have been attached when the text was translated into Arabic, and then most importantly, his name was still preserved uh, in a slightly mutated form, Philexeus, uh, when it was translated, this same East Syrian work was translated into Ge'ez uh, for the Ethiopian church. So in the Ge'ez recension, the Philexios text is paired with two other works, one by Isaac of Nineveh and another one by John of Daliatha, so both East Syrians and is called the Book of the Three Monks. All right, that's a lot of different authors and texts. Um, to recap, uh, two ecumenical processes were at work here. First, it's clear that monastic readers outside the Syrian Orthodox Church found Philoxenos' texts useful for learning contemplation. And when these readers were Miaphysites, uh, Philoxenos' name remained attached to the text. But when they weren't, the name of Isaac of Nineveh came to be attached. Although, this is a little bit interesting because these readers are Chalcedonian and Isaac of Nineveh is East Syrian. Um, but nevertheless, it seems that uh, Isaac's reputation was such um, that it could allow the text to be received 
Um, so Philoxenos uh, works circulated, but under the name of Isaac. Uh, on the other hand, when other East Syrian texts were received, the, the works of Joseph of Haziah and Dadisho, uh, Philoxenos' name was put on the text instead of these East Syrian authors, um, which allowed them to circulate and be acceptable uh, for use by Miaphysite monks. In any case, all of these phenomena are testimony to the fact that Philoxenos' name was an influential one, and his writings were popular with monastic audiences, regardless of what those audiences' view of Chalcedonian Christology was. Um, his works crossed linguistic and confessional boundaries, and his reputation was broad and authoritative, uh, such that ascetic works by East Syrian authors could be attributed to him. Uh, in this process, a subtle shift occurred in how Philoxenos uh, was remembered. Um, as André de Alleux has noted, one of the reasons that works attributed to Philoxenos were much likely to have been written by Dadisho or Joseph Uzziah is that those authors actually were solitaries, uh, ihidoye, uh, who practiced the solitary and com contemplative life. Uh, it's not that likely that Philoxenos, a busy bishop of a uh, metropolitan bishop, was able to do so. Uh, he was a bishop, an imperial ambassador, uh, appearing before the emperor, giving a confession of faith, uh, probably as far as a cleric can get from the uh, stillness of the solitary life. But in the history and in the reception, he was remembered as a teacher of ascetic contemplation in the Evagrian tradition, as if he had been such a solitary himself. Uh, so in those texts, the author's voice is hard to distinguish from a desert father. So Philoxenos himself seems to be received as if he speaks in the tradition of the desert fathers and mothers uh, of Egypt. So this brings me to my final observation on the legacies of Philoxenos, how he was received as a sort of desert father. Uh, and it's here where the attribution of works by Dadisho to Philoxenos shows that it's not merely a convenient uh, you know, sort of deception. In other words, oh, let's put this West Syrian name on it, on these works by an East Syrian author, so they'll be acceptable. Uh, indeed, that wasn't necessary. They could have put the name of Isaac of Nineveh on these works. So why did the name of Philoxenos get attached to these East Syrian monastic works? The reason is, there's a coherent theological reason. The reason is that Philoxenos is part of this chronological theological development. So we have the 6th and 7th century and onward East Syrian uh, authors, Isaac of Nineveh, Joseph Haziah, Dadisho, and John of Daliatha. But it's clear that Philoxenos sits uh, two centuries earlier in the development of this same Evagrian ascetic contemplative tradition. So in other words, the theology of Philoxenos when it comes to ascetic life, contemplative life, is clearly uh, setting up some of the things that Isaac of Nineveh, for example, uh, takes for granted. This is not to say that Isaac was aware that he received these ideas uh, from Philoxenos or that they were directly received, but more to say that both Philoxenos and Isaac are part of a shared or common Syriac development of Evagrian contemplation. This is something I've recently described in my book called The Library of Paradise, where I argue that we can see that Evagrius and Syriac became the anchor for a sort of Syriac Lectio Divina, uh, or a tradition of divine or contemplative reading. So in their Syriac form, Evagrius's works provide the structure for monks as they're reading and contemplating, both serving as reading material, so they read the works of Evagrius, both as, and then also as a guide to read, so they read Evagrius to learn how to read, uh, and as a model for contemplation. So they read these works by Evagrius and then Evagrian-inspired works like those by Philoxenos or those by Isaac of Nineveh as a way to learn how to practice contemplative reading, uh, a form of reading that eventually turns into prayer and divine vision. So uh, it's not clear when Evagrius' works first began to be translated into Syriac. Um, the earliest evidence for Syriac translations of Evagrius are in fact found in the works of Philoxenos. Um, about the same time as Philoxenos, we begin to have uh, West Syrian manuscripts with large collections of Evagrian texts, 
so say in the period 450 to 500 uh, AD. Um, and many of these manuscripts are West Syrian, but it's also clear that by the 6th century, East Syrian communities were reading of Vagrius in Syriac translation. And in fact, it may be that Philoxenos might have been taught to read of Vagrius in Syriac when he was still a student at the East Syrian school of Edessa. At the very least, we can guess that by the time that the school was forced to move from Nisibis, uh, move to Nisibis at the end of the 400s, the texts of Evagrius were available there to East Syrians as well as they were to West Syrians. Um, and Syriac interest in Evagrius continued to grow. By the late 7th century, the evagrian themed works of Palladius were collected and reissued with other ascetic works in a compendium called the Paradise. Um, one is attributed to Anisha, an Anisha of Adiabini, but it seems that there were many copies of this sort of paradise manuscript. So as I've shown in my book, in the century after Philoxenos' death, the Evagrian style of contemplation, which Philoxenos taught, became a central part of the 6th century East Syrian monastic reforms. So the ideas about contemplative life and the adaptation of Evagrian theology to fit the rich and earlier tradition of Syriac monasticism that began uh, in the works of Philoxenos was continued in the Church of the East. Uh, we don't know if Babai was aware of Philoxenos of Vagrian ascetic theology, but it is the case that Babai himself wrote commentaries on Evagrius. So uh, even though Babai uh, and Philoxenos are in a certain sense uh, enemies, or at least Babai views Philoxenos uh, as such, Interestingly, they're both also participants in this development of Syriac Evagrian theology. Um, so Babai probably does show an awareness of Philoxenos' monastic theology. Uh, of course, we wouldn't expect him to credit his Christological opponent for any influence. Um, what we can say is that Babai's interpretation of Evagrius exemplifies the reception of Evagrius into Syriac monasticism uh, that we also see in Philoxenos. Um, in the generation of after Babai, one can argue that Syriac of Agrianism comes full bloom in the Church of the East in these authors I've mentioned, Ananisho, Dadisho, Isaac of Nineveh. These all authors all just assume that their readers know who Evagrius is and accept him as an authoritative teacher. Um, and that tradition has been studied uh, in the last century by Irene Auxerre. Uh, but we modern scholars uh, were not the only ones to notice how closely the contemplative theology of Philoxenos and Isaac resemble each other. That's why when the works of Philoxenos ended up in Greek and Gez, the name of Isaac was attached to them by the medieval scribes. In other words, the medieval scribes themselves recognized this similarity in contemplative theology between Philoxenos, uh, the esteemed theologian of the West Syrian tradition, and Isaac, arguably the most influential theologian, uh, ascetic theologian of the East Syrian tradition. So this lineage from West Syrian to East Syrian author reveals uh, the ecumenical contribution of Philoxenos, um, but we can also add 19th and 20th century scholars uh, who noted the same thing. Um, so in fact, uh, the Greek, uh, the first Greek publication of Philoxenos uh, attributed to Isaac of Nineveh. It was published uh, by the Roman Catholic Cardinal uh, Angelo Mai, uh, and he endorsed the work, which is really by Philoxenos, but he thought it was by Isaac, as uh, being the summit of the sublime theories of contemplative science. Uh, Le sommet de la vertu et les théories sublimes de la science contemplative. So, uh, even 19th century uh, Catholic theologians of the contemplative life viewed these works by Philoxenos, but attributed to Isaac, as being acceptable for use uh, in uh, ca Catholic contemplative theology. So this brings me to uh, my conclusion, which is to say we've long known Philoxenos as the champion of uh, Chalcedonian theology, uh, or anti-Chalcedonian theology, excuse me, um, he's been long known as a saint in the Syrian Orthodox tradition. Um, and of course, within these other traditions, he's appeared, uh, especially in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, 
uh, where he's known for having his name attached to the Book of the Three Monks. But it's only now, uh, I would argue, in the last few decades that we're realizing the breadth of both his texts and the use of his name across the many uh, confessional traditions. And this really is the ecumenical legacy of Philoxenos. And I think uh, one that then helps also explain how today uh, Philoxenos could be an influential theological figure uh, among the St. Thomas Christians of India as well. Thank you. Let's see, Father Enjan, I think you might be on mute. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you, Malfono. Thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful, uh, short and sweet um, um, talk on how Felix more Felixinos of Mabug has been influential, not just in the Syriac Orthodox Church, but in other denominations, including uh, those people who consider him as a heretic. Um, that's wonderful to hear. And I have a few questions um, just to reflect upon. Um, <clears throat> One is like, you know, after two cent centuries, like Isaac of Nineveh is being influenced by the works of uh, Morphilexinus of Mabuk. Uh, but he is drawing into a Miaphysite bishop. So there are some um, uh, uh, theologians or scholars who still view that, you know, uh, these are linguistic misunderstanding, like, you know, the Miaphysite, the nat <laughs> one nature, two nature. Uh, it's more linguistic and cultural misunderstanding rather than, you know, how we actually define uh, the nature of God is. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to comment on that? Well, I'm not a, an, an expert on the uh, modern ecumenical agreements. Um, I would have two, two comments to say, uh, certainly in Philoxenos' own lifetime, the way that the different representatives of the confessions viewed each other suggests that their differences were more than just a misunderstanding. Um, now, it could certainly be the case that that both sides could not see the full ramifications of their their own positions. Of course, we have the luxury, uh, you know, now uh, sixteen to fifteen hundred years later. Uh, of seeing how these ideas would develop. But what I would argue is, in my first book on Philoxenos, The Practical Theology of Philoxenos, I do think that we can see that, that Christology is in some ways only a penultimate concern for him. In other words, what's important for him is the access of the faithful to the salvific work of Christ, to Christ's grace through the sacraments and the liturgy of the church. And so what he's concerned about is that a uh, misguided or improper Christology might confuse or disrupt or otherwise divert the faithful from understanding those mysteries. So uh, in many cases, um, and this you know comes out in the lifetime of Phloxnos, there's a, an official imperial degree called the Henoticon, uh, which today we might kind of call a gag order or something like this. In other words, people should stop arguing about Christology and they should worship Christ. And Philoxenos embraces this uh, pretty strongly, um, not because uh, he doesn't think that Christology is unimportant, but because it achieves his goal as a miaphysite, which is to get people to stop talking about diophysite Christology and instead let the faithful approach uh, the incarnation through the mysteries uh, of baptism, the Eucharist, uh, et cetera. So I don't know if that uh, helps uh, get down that direction, but I think he himself would be happy with uh, seeing that there's a part of his legacy uh, that's not merely about Christology. Like clearly this ascetic aspect of his writings is stands out as something that's very important. You, you know, anecdotally, I, I'm a Protestant, so, uh, you know, uh, grew up with only limited exposure to monasticism. When I first started reading Philoxenos, I felt like, oh, maybe he thinks the only real Christians are the monks. Uh, it's clear that monks are very important for him. So the fact that he has this ecumenical um, monastic perception, uh, I think it, it makes a, a good deal of logical sense. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, so my second question is something related to your own self-reflection. Um, um, ascetic theology, monastic theology, uh, Morphilexinos is being celebrated as an ascetic theology. Uh, but, you know, in 21st century, like, you know, what this theology can offer to the modern world, this may be something that, you know, the current generation may be wondering, like, you know, how can we make use of this theology? Like, you know, how can we make use of this ascetic theology? We cannot be monks. Um, you know, there can be monks, but uh, not everybody can be a monk. Like, you know, not everybody can uh, be an ascetic uh, person. You know, we are living in a busy world. And, you know, even Syriac Christianity itself is common, ma common people's Christianity. Mm -hmm. Now, when we consider common people's Christianity for today's world, how this is being uh, translated? Is, are there any thoughts? I know you're a historian, but you know history will be telling more truth about you know what, how you know things are happening in the current world as well. So yes, these are really excellent uh, questions, and uh, you know I may risk uh, being a traitor to uh, my own uh, class or profession here. You can see there are books lining the walls behind me. So I'm someone who uh, is blessed to read, get paid to read for a living as a as a teacher and a professor. Um, but one of the things I, that I've argued in my most recent book, The Library of Paradise, that we can learn from this Evagrian tradition, of which Philoxenos is a very important part, is that in the Syriac monastic tradition, there is another understanding of reading and the role of reading in the Christian life. Um, you know, today we're bombarded by words everywhere. Um, I'm not sure where I remember reading this, but, you know, based on the amount of text messages and tweets and, uh, you know, social media feeds and websites that anyone might read, uh, you know, we read tens of thousands, if not, uh, you know, uh, how many hundred thousand words per week but all of, you know, primarily the fleeting variety. Uh, and we tend to view reading as this consuming of whatever we're reading, right? So I'm taking it, I'm, I'm eating up the things that I'm reading. Well, in, in this Syriac tradition of contemplative ascetic reading uh, that we find both in Philoxenos, and I'll give you uh, a great quote from uh, him in a, in a moment, um, but also shared in the Church of the East and coming from Evagrius is this idea of that one is not actually reading for the sake of the words on the page, but one is reading to get access to knowledge of God. Uh, and surprisingly, even the reading of Scripture is not for its own sake. Now, certainly Philoxenos has a very high view of Scripture. He sponsors a revision of the Syriac New Testament because it's very important uh, to him that, uh, you know, the translation uh, be useful. Um, but what we find in Philoxenos and we find in Isaac of Nineveh is this sense of eventually one moves away from the words on the page and is moved into somehow the mind of God or contemplation of the Trinity or in the case of Isaac, understanding the extent of God's love as much as a limited human brain could understand such an infinite thing. Um, and in fact, uh, both Philox, well, Evagrius, Philoxenos, and Isaac all say that if at a certain point the monastic reader is still looking at the words of scripture and thinking, well, what is this? Is it a noun? Is it a verb? What does this word mean? That actually they've missed the point of reading scripture. The, the point of reading scripture is to encounter God uh, you know, you could be an expert on the meaning of the words on the page and not actually have encountered what they were put down for you to experience. Um, so, uh, you, you know, this is this is the sort of uh, thing that uh, Philoxenos writes about. Let's see. The, unfortunately, the quote um, from his letter to Patricius uh, is uh, escaping me right now. But it's it's something to the extent of. Uh, that uh, one shouldn't be too, too troubled about the grammar on the page. I like to uh, quote this to my students because, of course, they're learning Syriac and I am troubling them over the grammar on the page. 
Thank you, Malfono. Um, something in connection with uh, um, and this question and your reflection, um, the contemplative life, um, I mean, dedicating time for deep um, reading, um, you know, mindful thinking, uh, reflection, introspection, and things like that. So I think, you know, that is still relevant in today's world, um, uh, especially when we, many many of the uh, the, the modern practices will rely on something called mindfulness um, or, you know, uh, again, taking things from the Zen Buddhist tradition. But this is something that that we can offer to the modern world. I, I think, you know, the, the, the um, and maybe Isaac of Nineveh may be one best example to study and, you know, or maybe the Evagrian tradition itself, like, you know, how to meditate and things like that. So those kind of things, um, will help uh, in the modern world as well. Are there any reflections on um, this uh, contemplative life um, in your new book, uh, The Library of Paradise, or are there more things coming up? Yes. So, you know, like I said, that's something that I uh, really tried to tell the history of this story. In that book, largely, I tell it from the, the perspective of the Church of the East, but as I've just suggested in my lecture here, Philoxenos is very much part of that story. Um, one of the things I was most excited to find in the sources is that, uh, you know, of course, uh, saints are often presented as uh, prodigies, as children, but it seems very much that there's a, a tradition of teaching children to read in this prayerful way um, through learning to pray the Psalms, right? So when one reads the Psalms, is one praying? Is one reading? Uh, is one contemplating God's love? I mean, yes, all three things uh, at once. And so, uh, and in fact, really interesting in the Church of the East uh, and in the, the shared with the Syrian Orthodox traditions, we have a strong evidence that this is practiced by both men and women. So while the, you know, majority or perhaps all of the Syriac texts that survive from the medieval period are by men, there's clear evidence that both men and women, children and adults are practicing this contemplative form of reading, a form of reading that, that really is more about prayer than it is about acquiring knowledge, or at least, uh, you know, knowledge in the sort of modern textbook sense. Uh, it's about acquiring the, the interpersonal knowledge that say two human beings or a human being and God can have of each other um rather than you know acquiring facts or something like this um the final question is something about like you know the attributed morphilexinos um there are many works that are attributed uh to morphilexinos we have in india we have a tradition um there are daily prayers um these are private prayers for a, in each day you can do a prayer in the morning in evening and you know there's timely um, uh, prayers. Um, these are. I talked to some other scholars. They said like this is these are not the original works, but you know these are attributed works. But you know those are beautiful prayers. Um, are there any kind of any researchers or you know any any scholars are interested in um, this kind of work, like you know especially the liturgical. Uh, attributed Philexinos, quote-unquote, kind of work? Well, that's what I was hinting at in my lecture. Uh, we really need uh, uh, the next generation to take this up. Um, you know, I've had the, the privilege of um, uh, visiting the old seminary in Kotayam and, uh, you know, hearing some of those prayers. And, of course, I've seen some of these manuscripts. Um, and, uh, you know, sadly, if there's one area... Uh, that's been neglected in the field of Syriac studies, it's the study of the liturgy. Now, partly because it's so, uh, you know, it, it's an incredibly complex topic and uh, one would need to gather manuscripts from multiple continents. But I think that now, uh, you know, here I'll speak from a, a different area of my own research, the digital research I've done with Syriaca.org. We are now reaching a stage where we have reference works that we didn't have a hundred years ago that might begin to allow us to trace some of the history of these liturgical texts 
where did they come from? When did the attributions get added? So, uh, you know, what I would hope is that, uh, you know, 10 years from now, someone younger than me has written this as a, as a dissertation. So perhaps one of your viewers here who's listening to this, uh, you know, will take this as uh, perhaps a, a divine call to uh, go and study the topic. We hope so. Like, you know, there are more people come up with more serious kind of approach to Suryak studies, especially as you pointed out, the liturgical um, Suryak text and its meaning and its theology, uh, because everything is, it, when it comes to Suryak Christianity, it's everything is rooted and founded um, in the liturgy. Um, yeah, let's hope and pray for that. That's right. Um, Thank you so much, Malfona, for this wonderful discussion and the presentation. Um, I know you are very busy, and you know, um, Deacon Jobin, um, you know, um, you know, he was reaching out to you, and you know, we I think you know we planned a year ag ago, and like you know, somehow this was not happening. Um, uh, it was not your fault; it was our fault, um, and it's nobody's fault. It, it's God's time. That's Let's right. look at that way. Well, thank you so much. This has been a, a real pleasure. I, uh, I'm glad that it, it did happen. Uh, and, uh, you know, e even more than that, it's just my joy to uh, suggest that Philoxenos and the Syriac of Agrian tradition can really be a, a second shared heritage for the different Syriac churches and confessions. In other words, uh, you know, of course, there's the very sh early shared tradition of the Peshitta and more Ephraim, etc. But but this is a sort of a second moment after Chalcedon where, uh, you know, if we may speak providentially, God worked to create a shared theological heritage among these churches that otherwise, uh, you know, were divided. Uh, and so I hope for in the future that... Uh, the different Syriac communities might appeal to that uh, to investigate their shared heritage and with the other Eastern Christian communions. So, uh, you know, I think uh, the heritage of Morphiloxenos as a bridge between Syrian Orthodox and Ethiopian Orthodox communities is really something that has not been explored uh, almost at all yet. So uh, something else to look forward to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Malfono, Dr. Um, and Dr. Michelson uh, for this wonderful uh, presentation and time shared with us uh, and the discussion and the reflections as well um, on, on behalf of um, all our viewers uh, here at Orhodove and on behalf of Archbishop Mortitus Eldo of Malengra Archdiocese, you know, uh, let me express a formal thank you uh, for your time and the work and may God bless continue to shower all divine blessings upon you and may he continue to um you know bless and guide you in all your academic endeavors and we um wish all the best for the new book i think you know it, the, the new book was published last year so uh, we we look forward to more works from you um and you know pray for us as well and thanks once again thank you all viewers and all glory to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one true God, forever and ever. Amen. Barak Moore, thank you.